Get started. Um, my name is Pat Helland. I arrived at, the, at UC Irvine in September of 73 as a 17-year-old undisciplined twit. <laughs> and I was a math major and started, there was this ICS-1 class. I didn't know what the hell it was, so I started to go. And there were these teletypes on the second floor of ICS-2 and a Xerox Sigma-7. And the class was in basic. And I learned about a linked list. I learned about a push down stack. But I didn't know any of this junk. Okay. And I fell head over heels. By the end of that quarter, I was beside myself with the fact that I would not have a computer to program for the next three, four weeks. So I went to Martin Kay, the chairman. I said, can I have a computer account? This is going to be horrible. I'm going to die if I can't program. And he, I gave him a plan to do, you know, line printer output of an of a equation. He said, fine, but you have to accept the equation as a string and parse the string. And he explained reverse Polish to me. And he gave me an account. I come back in January, and I show him that it all works. And I had my first graduate class one-on-one -on -one with Martin Kay at, shortly before my 18th birthday. And this place let me take graduate classes immediately. I soaked up computer science, flunked out of my math classes, didn't do any English or history, and was obsessed over it until in the middle of the night, because you had to stay up in the middle of the night to use a computer because you couldn't afford to use it during the day. I ended up at the coffee shop down at Main and MacArthur, met my late wife. She was 23, I was 19. She had three kids, I moved in. She was pregnant, so I dropped out and got a job. So I never got a degree. But this place changed me. It gave me a passion. It gave me a fire in my belly. And I wonder what would have happened if I'd continued on. But then again, I was still a lazy twerp. And having four kids to feed taught me to work. So how that evolved, I don't know. But I'm here, and I'm thrilled to be here. And so we're supposed to talk about entrepreneurship. And I've gone on and built things. I got into databases, transactions, you know, all sorts of big systems, distributed systems. For 40 years, I've worked on them. But that passion came from here. And I've built stuff. And this is a session about building things. They label it entrepreneurship. It wouldn't have been the title I'd given it. But it's like, how the hell do you build stuff? And what did this place give us to help us build stuff? So I'm going to take it away. Intro? Yeah, intro for yourself, and then talk about how you build stuff. OK. Uh, uh, so my name is Kevin Thompson. Uh, I came here in 1986. Uh, I was interested in AI and machine learning. Uh, I had not actually majored in computer science undergrad. Which I think they figured out during the admissions process, but I'm not quite sure. Um, I was here for two years and got a good solid round in computer science, which has served me very well for the 30 years since. Uh, but my thesis advisor actually uh, took his research group up to NASA Ames in the Bay Area. Um, so in a kind of backwards way, what Irvine did was introduce me to Silicon Valley. Uh, and I went up to NASA Ames and was a bad grad student uh, for a good chunk of time. Um, published some papers uh, and did some applications, but along the way, actually built an open source version of something called Cobweb, which for those who remember Doug Fisher um, had been his research program. Uh, and I found I had users, and I decided users were really interesting, and I was much, much more motivated by the people who were using the open, it wasn't called open source back in the medieval era, but. It was roughly open source software. Uh, and I was much more motivated by users using my software than I was by talking about my research in front of a bunch of people. And living in Silicon Valley, I thought to myself that maybe there was some place I should be other than research if I like users and my stuff. Um, so I made the ta uh, strategic decision, uh, which was actually valid in 1994, to when I went into industry, I left behind machine learning because there was no commercial applications, um, which actually seemed like a fairly reasonable decision to make at that point in time. Um, Point in time. It was. Uh, actually, I missed I, I, one of my, my most cited paper. Um, it's a sort of a theoretical analysis from AAAI 90, but it is based on a vast data set of 106 DNA promoter sequences. Not 106 million, <laughs> not 106,000, 106. So my go to line for the young folks is usually I'm, I'm from the era of small data. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, I then spent about 10 years in a bunch of small companies, none of which are super important, one of which I founded. Um, so I did go through, I founded a company in Web 1.0 when no one knew what worked. Um, on the internet, et cetera, build a free service uh, that didn't go anywhere, uh, and then went right from a bunch of small, irrelevant companies to Google with sort of no in-between. Uh, spent 12 years at Google, uh, eventually leading several hundred-person teams, 
uh, got bored of doing ads after 12 years, and I now lead a several hundred person team at Uber. Um, so if you have complaints about your Uber prices and matching, please feel free not to talk to me afterwards. <laughs> I'm Owen O'Malley. I came here in 87 in the PhD program and graduated in 96. So yeah, I was actually Deborah's first student, both to start and to finish, which, um, although she called me a gradual student while I was graduating. So. Um, so what did I learn here? I learned that if you want to build something, just Spend time and build it. Actually, that's how I decided I wanted to go into industry rather than go into research. A, I hate writing grant proposals, absolutely despise it. But the second thing is, after I had spent a couple weeks writing a paper, I would sit down and code all night. I mean, I just needed to get back and build something. And that came from here, right? I also got exposed, uh, Roy Fielding was at school at the same time, and Open source was a huge thing, and so that has continued to resonate through me. I, uh, I spent a lot of years doing different companies. I do two years here, two years there. Then I made the <clears throat> oh so awesome decision to go to Yahoo Search instead of Google Search when I had an <laughs> offer from both. <laughs> yeah, I regretted that one for a while. But, <laughs> my, um, but it actually worked out OK, because at Yahoo, the reason I picked Yahoo was because I got to pick the people I was working with. And that was really important to me. Right? I got to choose what I was working on, what I was, who I was working with. And working with smart people is the most important thing, because you're going to be spending a lot of time with these people, and you absolutely need to, to enjoy working with these people and trust them. Um, so anyway, at Yahoo, I was working on the, this back end, and we were like, oh, we needed to, um, we read the papers from Google about, oh, they've got MapReduce, let's do that. And so we started implementing one of those. And we had actually implemented one and made the very frustrating decision to throw it all away and start with one that was already open source. And that's the code base that became Hadoop, which is the uh, main big data open source project. Um, a few years later, uh, one of the um, venture capitalists was trying to get a big data story together for, for benchmark capital. And he looked around, looked at, at some other companies, and was like, OK, these guys aren't driving it. Those guys at Yahoo are driving it. And so he started a three-way negotiation between us Yahoo and um, Benchmark to get us launched. And we actually formed a new company, and that became Hortonworks. And um, so it was quite a ride. Um, first of all, it took a year and a half to get out of Yahoo, because Yahoo did not know how to spin out companies. But, um, but that has been a really wild ride, uh, taking a company. We never did the three people in a garage thing, um, <laughs> fortunately. We started with a customer with 22 engineers. And let me tell you, if you ever have a company where you've got the engineers saying, oh, we don't want any managers. They just get in our way. We had 22 engineers and no managers. That's not a good state, because what happens is you finish something, and then you're like, hey, Joe needed to do this. And he hasn't even started, because he didn't realize he was going to be on the critical path once you finished your piece. And so yeah, managers are good. <laughs> um, so that's my story. I'm Sam Smart Ashburn. Um, I came to UCI as a transfer student from a junior college uh, and graduated in 1987 with a degree in computer science. Um, so one of the few women, I think as Deborah mentioned, you know, she walked in and there wasn't a lot of women there. Uh, that was pretty much my experience for all my computer science courses. But I loved computer science. I loved solving problems. Um, learned so much when I was here. Uh, new languages, it seemed like every quarter. And then I went out into the real world, because I was uh, tired of starting, um, and got my first job. And it was with Hughes, Elect uh, Hughes Aircraft Company at the time, and uh, on a classified project. So they, you, know, you get a, a, a top secret, and you, they send you off to this place. And um, it was like having my own little startup right there, because I had a bunch of uh, users, and I love my users, I really <laughs> did, because they, they had ideas of what they wanted to accomplish, and I was the one who could uh, get it done for them. 
And one of my first projects, uh, they're like, oh, we have to do an inventory control system, go build it. I'm like, all right, I, I, but sure, that sounds fantastic. And I think what UCI just gave me the confidence. It's like, well, you, you know how to do things, just go figure it out. Had to go learn new language, new database, new everything. Um, and uh, it continued throughout the career. We've, uh, I was worked for DirecTV, um, and I think I see another direct, former DirecTV person up there in the audience as well. Uh, now we're in AT&T, uh, and so we've been doing machine learning. It all comes back to machine learning. I remember we did quite a bit of AI back in, uh, when I was in school. And just to see it grow, it's, it's, it's not theoretical anymore. It's, it's out there being practiced. Um, but yeah, I think it's really been fantastic. Um, my name is Andreas Gall. Uh, I came here in 2001 from Germany, as my accent probably has already given away uh, before I told you that. Um, originally, my plan was here to get a PhD and go back to Germany and teach. Uh, that plan pretty quickly fall, uh, fell apart. Uh, it turns out I'm a very delicate flower. I don't do well in a cold. So the moment I came here, <laughs> I was like, I'm not leaving again. Um, so that was fun. I graduated in 2006. And uh, I worked on uh, a compilation technique uh, with Michael Franz. And uh, I ended up applying it to a very strange kooky language, at least in 2006, called JavaScript. And I was writing papers how we could make JavaScript really fast. And uh, every reviewer thought it's really stupid. Um, and instead, the web should just use Java, and all the problems would be solved. Um, the only person who liked it was Brendan Eich, the uh, inventor of JavaScript, who was the co-founder of Mozilla and uh, was running Mozilla and building Firefox. He kind of liked that idea and invited me to come up for three months, in air quotes, uh, to the Bay Area to work on my uh, dissertation topic and, and practice in industry. And I went up there. I built the first JavaScript compiler for Mozilla. We shipped it in Firefox. And uh, I'm still there, apparently. Um, <laughs> so the three months were a little longer than I thought, but it turns out it's really fun to build stuff that tons of millions of people use. I stayed there for many years. I helped them from, to go from desktop into mobile. I built a smartphone operating system there, um, competing with iOS and Android, which was really fun. And then I left uh, a little bit over three years ago to do a startup. Um, we did, did uh, for three years embedded machine learning, uh, which is not a class I've ever taken. So basically, I have the opposite path. I've never taken a class in machine learning until I started a company doing that for three years. <laughs> so that was really fun, too. And then uh, we got acquired about six months ago. So I'm on my first tour of duty, uh, which is an entirely fun thing as well. And uh, yeah, today I'm here. So my name is Tony Givargis. I joined ICS in 2001 as an assistant professor. Uh, so currently, I'm in the Department of Computer Science. I'm also vice chair for undergraduate studies. Uh, my research is in embedded systems, uh, cyber physical systems, and uh, embedded software in general. About five years ago, a, a meeting with a friend at a coffee shop turned into the beginning of a, of a company by the name Levix. Um, um, Levix makes analytics and analytics uh, compute platform uh, specifically for low latency sort of real-time applications. And uh, it's been VC funded for about three years. So um, sort of to answer the question of, of how do you build big systems, I was essentially recruited as a co-founder to help with talent acquisition. So being a professor here, I, I um, managed to recruit a lot of really good students um, that joined the company. We have about 15 engineers. About half of those came from UCI. And the way you build a good system is you get really good people who love to code and solve problems. So, you guys have disparate experience. I have different experiences. How do you get stuff built? How do you get it started? There's this entrepreneur question. And I'm an architect in big companies. I've worked at Microsoft and Salesforce and Amazon and Tandem. And getting stuff started is different in a big company than a little company. It's different in, in the university. What are the, the themes? How can we make it possible in the future for the kids? How can we help them to learn what it means to get Finding something that you're passionate about is the most important piece. Find something that you can do relatively quickly, at least a prototype, mm -hmm. and get that up and running quickly, right? And it doesn't even matter. Actually, it's almost better if you don't need to ask permission, right? Don't ask permission. Just make something. Make a demo of it. Make it cool. 
and you will get people to buy into it. And then you can get approval to get more people working on it with you to make it better. But you can get that first demo up and show the joy in the project I don't before you build with it that, up. But does it matter if it's useful? Does it matter if it fits the business <laughs> need? How well, do you think about that? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. And I, I mean, I don't it, disagree with what you said. You have to be solving something the business cares about, or it won't be, it's a personal project, not something well, at your work. So you have to be solving a problem that, that is a real problem, but it can be a problem that other people haven't recognized yet, yeah. right? Because you can, part of what happens is you get more experience is you start seeing further and further out. It's like, okay, this is a problem for the org. No one's looking at this. And if we fix, if we solve that problem, then whole bunches of the other pieces get easier instead of making all these other pieces change to, to adapt to the current system, we can make it more unified and, and solve a lot of problems. I, I, I like a thought around like recognizing some problem that needs to be solved. Um, the first time I heard someone really speak to me about entrepreneurship was when I started at Mozilla, their then CEO, who's now venture capitalist in the Valley, John Lilly, um, was announcing that he's leaving and he wants to be a venture capitalist. And he described entrepreneurship as like, you, you see this kind of wrinkle in the universe, and you look mm -hmm. around and nobody else can see it. It's really eerie, it's like, we're going crazy? Like, it's, it's so obvious, why does nobody else see it? And then you kind of go and pry it open and uh, you create an opportunity out of that. And I had no idea what he meant uh, until like maybe seven, eight years after. And uh, one morning I woke up and uh, machine learning was really taking off. And uh, I was wondering, why do we do this on the server side? We should be doing this with the data as an embedded systems. And like, I asked everyone I knew, like, why don't we do that? And, no, nobody seemed to really be bothered by it, and I was so bothered by it I couldn't uh, <laughs> to work on it. Uh, so I think it's a process, and you, you kind of yeah. get you, at some point you get an idea in your head, and it just won't let go if you want to do it. Yeah, I mean, in, in some uh, larger companies, they'll do hackathons, they'll have mm -hmm. ideas. We just had one about two months ago, and they invited teams to participate. They gave them a team to work on, and. Uh, the top two ideas were allowed to get funded. So one of my teams, uh, some of the folks that worked with me, we came in second. But that was okay because they still got funded. The top two got funded and they're going to make it a reality. So it was a real world business problem that they put out there. They didn't put a lot of parameters around it. Um, so it allowed for a lot of creativity. And they, they were able to come up with a fantastic idea. We figured it out there within two months. I mean, uh, Owen gave kind of the engineer's version. I mean, the, the more VP version and then just some of what you... I, I, I do believe in hackathons. We've done them a lot at both YouTube and Uber. Uh, but I find that uh, the ideas that are emergent don't always tend to be fully aligned with what you need. To me, it's about an organizational alignment. And I mean, that's a very political answer, but it's the real answer. Software engineering is a team sport. And like getting a lot of people to buy into. There's a new approach to have them understand what the problem is, why you want to solve the problem in a different way. It's right what I'm going through right now as we do 2019 planning. Um, because what I am trying to do in this particular case is going to take 10 people six months. You can't build a quick demo. There's no quick demo to fundamentally approaching Uber pricing differently. There is getting people to believe that this approach is likely to pay off for all the reasons of what we're currently doing is not paying off in the way we want it to. You understand, as an architect, I define my job as make stuff up and sucker people into building it. <laughs> and, and, and so that's kind of what you said at one level. Mm -hmm. But there's another thing you said, which is identifying the business problem. Mm -hmm. How do we make our students have a sense for what that is? And I know they're going to come out young and they're going to take years before they really can get that uh, bigger, broader lay of the land to, to think about it. But that's an area where if we talk about the next 50 years, we have to cook the kids. So they know what it means to understand and use the force and feel the needs and then propose things that match the needs rather than have to be told, you know, in the small, then the bigger, then the bigger as you work your way up the maturity ladder. Do you have any thoughts on that? So I'll give my answer and then others can chime in. Uh, I think somebody mentioned earlier passion. I mean, a lot of it is like you have to care about what your company is doing. Um, that's pretty easy to sell in my current company. And that's a big piece of it. A big piece of it is empathy. We, uh, I, I'm a profound believer in not letting product managers be the arbiters of what's important, 
by being the only people who talk to customers. I've met some um, too. Yes, <laughs> when, when I uh, started in my job, I uh, had my first end all hands. I was about three weeks in. I said, how many of you have ever driven for Uber? And one hand went up. And I was like, OK, that's a problem. And we solved that like instantly. And within six months, everybody on my team who was legal to drive, there are certain constrictions around that. Uh, and it's incredible the empathy you get. The very first time you get behind the wheel, the very first time you pull up. My first Uber experience, I pulled up to a family of six with nine pieces of luggage and a five, <laughs> and a five, and a five seat car. It was very exciting. Um, and I learned of a problem that I had not seen before. Um, so a lot of it's around building empathy. Uh, and it's a lot of it is just continually giving people full business context. Um, I both in uh, all, all my last several jobs, like I'm constantly over communicating constantly having finance, Sam, oversharing all the numbers because I think it's really important for people to understand all the dynamics of the business and be able to build their own theories of what needs to happen. Yeah, I think Kevin's point is spot on about building empathy with the customer and thinking about it from the customer's point of view, but even more, getting into their, their shoes and trying to solve their problems is really what leads you to, to solving the business problems because it's fine for, I, I mostly work on infrastructure, right? So I'm building frameworks for other people to use. In theory, that's great. And I can talk to the PMs and they'll be, okay, you should build this. But in practice, I find when I go and talk to the customers, they've got a completely different set of needs. So things that the PMs are working on, are thinking about are important, but the customers have a whole other set of needs that the PMs aren't even aware of. We teach this to people. I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, and I, I mean the, the the trends are so different. So when I went to school, you know, we chances are when I graduated, I'd be working on more practical for business type solutions, uh, billing systems, um, computer systems for. Uh, radars, you know, th those type of things. And now it's really about these products that people use on their personal iPhones, tablets, computers. So at least I think there is a better understanding of what people would want. But I think you still need to understand those design elements and how things fit in, as well as understanding uh, the basics of, of coding and good, good coding design. I mean, a lot of the, the methodologies and I was doing like this extreme programming when I first started without realizing it was extreme programming. <laughs> so I sat like right next to the people who were the business users and I like, hey, I did this. They're like, well, change this a little bit. I mean, we were working really closely together and I had to unlearn that when we got into these uh, longer software development life cycle things. I had to learn that we had to, you know, different people would go and get requirements and then they would do, someone else would do design and someone else would do the coding and someone the testing and at the end, if you were lucky, the user got to see a demo right before you went live. Um, and now the trend is going back to that working really closely with your product owners. So the people who understand what that product's supposed to look like, as the marketing and all that around it, they're with you every day helping you build the right thing. You build a little and show them, build a little and show them. So we're back to that. So I think it's, it's, that's what you've got to learn how to do. Um, to truly deliver the right thing. You know, don't take 12 months to build it, and then you show them and it's, it's gonna be wrong, I guarantee you. Yeah, especially when they're just beginning in the career, right, the, the junior developers, it's really easy. The worst mistake I made when my first job was going off and building something for three months and then going back and saying, hey, is this what you wanted? And they're like, close, but not quite. And you never realize, you can never underestimate how much people care about the color and the location of things on the screen. <laughs> and they have software people working on it too. Go figure that yeah. out. <laughs> I think a part of the problem why it's so hard for us to grasp what does it take to kind of understand how to build products for consumers is that it's not really a technology problem. And it's not, I think, the kind of classes you traditionally take in a computer science education that will teach you that. For me, one of the biggest piece of learning in the early days of starting the company was really on a storytelling. Like how do I tell a compelling story to an investor that makes them give me millions of dollars of their hard-earned money, <laughs> of someone else's hard-earned money? That's and uh, uh, that's very different from what you learn in ICS. Like in, in, in my PhD program, I learned a wide toolbox of academic arguing methods to argue you into a hole, like pour data over you, and like, like just bury you in all my facts. 
And that is not how you sell people on things, as I learned the hard way. Um, so instead, you, it's really about storytelling. And like, I, I wish I could go back in time and like, take a couple of English classes, take a couple of classes on like, what makes people tick, mm -hmm. psychology, and what they, makes groups interact with each other, social sciences. Those classes, I think, are incredibly important to understand, if you're especially making consumer products for people. So, um, You'd be surprised how much is true for enterprise products in the belly of a server. It's you've got to convince somebody. I'm just surprised hearing myself say these things because I remember 10 years ago when I was studying computer science, I was like, well, why do people take these classes? But uh, <laughs> they actually do make sense. And we should try to give people a rounded education where they have the ability to kind of empathize and understand other humans and what makes them tick. And that's how I figure out what kind of product they would like to buy from you. Oh, I think um, one of the things I would, as an educator, would, would add to this would be to um, have more capstone projects as part of um, degree programs. Some of our programs already have that. And invite more industry sort of people to come and give guest lectures and participate in some of those projects. And I think informatics does, uh, does some of that in, in, in some of its courses. So that's definitely a way to bring this a little bit into, into the educational system. In a startup, it's a little bit easier to get all of your engineers to be part of the sales activity. So I know at Levix, we, we oftentimes have engineers take part in, in sales meetings and, and actually go to customer sites and, and interact with, with their customers. I think that becomes a little bit harder in, in bigger organizations where you have more levels of So, you know, there's different kinds of entrepreneurship. We've been talking about that, different aspects of what it takes to create it. Do you think big companies are fostering that culture, helping their, helping their employees learn it? Um, and how can there be a partnership between the big companies or the medium-sized and little companies with universities to try to, to grow that understanding of what it takes to walk up to nothing and make something? Because that's kind of what we're talking about. Do you see that being encouraged in the big companies? Do you think that it's only scrappers who fight their way into that? I think there's definitely something special about entrepreneurship in the sense that you get given a certain amount of money to solve a task. And uh, if that money is done, your company is dead. So that, that's, right. <laughs> that's different than most, comp like most big companies, uh, usually. So I, I think there's something that's difficult about that to recreate. Uh, every big company that you can name is, have, is like, wants to disrupt itself and behave like a startup and insert your buzzwords of choice. And uh, I don't think it really leads to the same outcomes usually. Um, that doesn't mean that there's no ways for people to learn how to build things. That, I, I learned how to build things at a fairly large company that makes half a billion dollars a year. Um, and that very much helped me then start my own startup. But it was still a very different process. And I think it's a little bit kind of red herring for companies to kind of like try entrepreneurship inside the cozy confines of like a steady salary that you get from a big company. Um, so I think there's a balance to be struck between like what's really entrepreneurship and, and how can you as a company foster and, and help people to build things. A couple of the good approaches I've seen, for example, there's companies that really encourage people to leave. And uh, that's not like a sign of like disloyalty. <laughs> in, in different kinds of techniques to do that. Yeah, so, and, well, <laughs> it's a in a positive sense, it's like, if you really want to leave and start a company uh, and it doesn't work out, like this yeah. next year, you don't even have to apply, you just come back. And at my current employer, I've seen that, and uh, that's, that's actually pretty positive. And I think that helps people to grow personally, and uh, it also helps the company keep those entrepreneurial people around. So if it doesn't work out, they come back for a while, kind of recharge the cash batteries, and then try again. Well, I've got to say, I have seen counterexamples. I mean, hack days, for example, are actually a wonderful source of inventiveness and creativity in, in the setting of work, even in big companies, actually, especially in big companies. But actually, even getting a project to the place where you can uh, convince a set of people to work on it inside of a big company can do wonders, yep. right? I've seen some really amazing products come out of exactly that kind of Unquirk's project that grows out of just someone's passion. They're great when they succeed, but they're actually great when the projects don't because it gives yeah. people a creative outlet and a way to refresh themselves in a very positive way. I think. I mean, and DirecTV was, a, was built out of Hughes Aircraft Company, but it was built as a, as a, as a startup within it. And they you know, devoted some, some funds and an idea, and uh, it was very much a different culture even than the rest of the company. Um, so, you know, you, you can do that, especially if you're starting off with kind of a new product line. 
I guess I don't think of it as much as in terms of entrepreneurship within a huge company. I mean, Google was 80,000 people, I think, when I left. It's just a portfolio investment strategy. Um, there were different uh, eras of it at Google, but there was a point in time where they, you know, it's the whole innovator's dilemma thing. We were making 99.9% of our money from search ads, but that probably wasn't the right thing to do forever. And we had a 70-20-10 was the, the way that Sergey characterized it. And 70% was in search and ads, which was our bread and butter. And 20% was in adjacency, was which probably in that era was Gmail and Calendar and Docs and I don't remember what else. And 10% were like totally stupid ideas, like building our own browser and our own uh, phone operating system. <laughs> um, and, and scanning every book on earth and I don't remember some other crazy things that never went anywhere. Some of them worked. <laughs> um, and, but like at all levels and then within search there was like the core stuff that we knew we needed to do and then there were the kind of crazy ideas. And so at every level they tried to give reserve capacity for crazy ideas. Um, so, but, but, but at the same time trying to make sure we focused on our bread and butter and I felt like that worked fairly well. That's great. What can we do to help in the future, prepare people for that. Any ideas on that? What can we teach them? I mean, uh, yeah, I think you know, as I mentioned, was you know having these these project classes where you're working yeah. directly with yeah. industry. I think one of the things when I was a student, I was taking all these courses and doing all this work. I loved it, but it was really hard to see how that world world example and how it would fit. how it would fit together. And when I see these projects now, um, they have the showcases. Uh, and it's just so impressive, and these students are able to work directly on industry problems with companies, and very diverse, you know, helping out with a Broadway show, something that they needed, you know, that's just, that's fantastic. So I, my, my, I, I, I am a huge fan of the Waterloo program, and like, I would love to see more programs like that, where, uh, I don't remember exactly the schedule, maybe you do off the top of your head, but it's you spend, you because I, I envy 20 year olds these days, or I, the number of 22-year-olds I've met who've done a summer each at Amazon, Google, and Facebook, and they just have like more industry experience than I did when I was 40. I want to kill them, <laughs> but I'm super envious. But I think in, I don't know, what is it, 11 weeks, 10 weeks, you just can't get that much done. The Waterloo program is much more interspersing, like full semester, yeah. and it comes out to be like four to five months. And the, the Waterloo people I've met, I think they graduate at 23, typically, of course, uh, but they've done significant program projects at multiple different school. things. It's a great and I would love to see more schools adopt things like that for really um, coming out of school, and it's exactly, I think, what Sandy has said, that learning that algorithms class I took six weeks ago is directly applicable to this company I'm in now. I understand. And I love the Waterloo stuff. I agree with everything you said. But even the shorter internships, watching the kids come mm -hmm. and watching them leave two, three months later, they're different. Sure. They've learned a lot. It gets in their soul. I mean, I, I, the six months actually. Is, I mean, there's a huge difference with I'm not disagreeing between with you. the ten weeks and the, mm -hmm. the six months, right? Uh, Northeastern is another one that has the co-ops that are six months long baked into their program, where you work with a company for six months, and, and that seems like a wonderful. They program. change. The, it's it's so great the exposure, the things that you don't even think matter when you're in school. All of a sudden, oh my gosh, I see how this ties into building out a big project and why we have to do this together and going to scrum and standing up and listening to what your teammates are doing and saying, oh yes, I got it done or oh no, I didn't get it done and how does it integrate and what do you mean somebody has to code review before it signs off? Well, somebody has to code review before it signs off. And that kind of stuff I think is super powerful from the standpoint of becoming part of a team, right? And so the, the actual topic of this panel has been, how do, you, how do you start stuff? And I don't have one answer for that. The answer is, to me, the school teaches so many background things, but then there's other layers of things that aren't available typically in the school, and you have to add them up to really figure out how to start stuff. That's kind of what I feel. But yeah, I think a, a, you know, when, you, when you're in school, you don't realize how many different roles there are in industry. You know, there's people who devote their careers <sighs> to just doing the architecture, enterprise architecture, some people just to application architecture. Um, there's people who do just business analysis, uh, system analysis, coding, uh, production support, operations. And I think one thing that I would always recommend to people now is try all those roles, because if you really want to be an entrepreneur, you got to know how it all fits together. It's not just about writing a piece of code, you have to know 
well, what is it that you need to write? Why, what is the business case? Um, how do you make sure it's going to scale? It's a little easier now, at least with uh, cloud computing. You don't have to have your own data centers. But still, you got to understand about security. Security is such an issue these days. Uh, yeah, but what you get in Amazon and Google and so forth is just mm -hmm. a bunch of virtual computers. Right. You've still got to build stuff. So you got to understand how all that fits together, because I think if you're going to truly go out there and be a successful entrepreneur in the software space, you need to understand what all that is. You don't have to be an expert at it all, but at least get a, a sense of what that is. Do you think as complex as computer science has become, that we need to have more narrow tracks and the kids can kind of pick between them, but somebody who's targeting building interesting business applications doesn't really need to know a ton about compilers and distributed systems and a whole, and, and where do you draw that line and is it worthwhile to give a, a depth for that area that you're targeting versus more of the breadth? And this is a thing that's coming up as this environment gets more complex. My take on that is that it's most important in school to learn how to learn, right? Um, and the important part about school, actually grad school especially, was being around a lot of really bright people working on really hard problems and figuring out how to work together, how to split up the problem, and how to learn new things. And that is true regardless, right? Computer science is always changing. What I love about being in the software field is that it's different every decade, right? That what we're working on changes. What's important is different. And and so you, it's really about how to learn. That's got to be the most critical piece for me. I understand, but still, what are we going to send them out having been? So you, you need to deep dive in particular parts, but which particular deep parts don't matter as much as the fact that you've deep dived somewhere. I don't disagree. For, for people at the cutting edge, I would assert, OK, there's a lot of people who just want to get the checklist and go get the job and then go get the, the barbecue in the backyard. Um, and, and I don't denigrate, I'm not saying that's bad, but what you said is true for someone who's going to carry and carry and carry and push. And so how do we think about that? How do we think about the relationship between just preparing the folks who are going to get the job done versus the folks who are going to make that ginormous difference? You can, uh, so I, first of all, I fully agree. I, I basically, I'm not doing the last 10 years anything I learned in grad school. But I'm <laughs> applying the same techniques that I've learned every day. Um, so I, I think you're, you're definitely onto something there. Last night when we had dinner, uh, we, we, we talked about like what did uh, UCI or ICS in particular give you in particular to kind of support your entrepreneurial spirit, and I thought about that all night long, so thanks for keeping me up at night. Um, <laughs> and I came up with a couple examples, but one that kind of stuck in my mind was that when I started with Michael Franz here at, at, at uh, ICS, he had money for a couple of projects that I really didn't want to work on. And uh, I didn't understand how like funding works. So there was just like this benevolent something gives my professor money on these topics. <laughs> that and then I want to work, not work on them. So uh, I, I asked him, can I work on this other thing that I think is much cooler? And he said, I don't have money for that, but you can submit grants. So in my flip-flops and, and, and shorts, I walked into the research administration office of ICS and told them, hey, I'm, I'm Andreas. I want to like, submit grants and like, go to DARPA and NSF and all these things. And uh, they could have just said, like, go stay in your lane. Like, write papers to what your advisor tells you, or they could have done what they did. It's like, here's a research administration management program, and like, sit down, let's like, talk about the grants you want to submit, and how can we help you? And um, I submitted a whole bunch of grants. Some of them were not completely stupid. Some of them even got funded. And uh, it, it taught me that if I see something and I want to do something, I will find people who will like, support that and enable me. And uh, basically, my, the rest of my career was just like that. I had some crazy idea, and someone decided to like, give it a try. So um, I think this is something we should definitely do. If, if, if you see students around you want to do things, and there's anything that you can do to enable that, go and enable that. Whether it's like he wants to submit research grants, or be in student government, or build something inside the school. Whenever you see a spark like that, I think helping the student turn that into a fire, in a strictly metaphorical sense, um, <laughs> it's, it's good. Anybody else? I think there has to be a, a sense of curiosity, too. That's what's always been. For me, it just, you know, especially if you step into a brand new role or a brand new company, there's always going to be a lot of stuff there. Some of it's not going to make any sense. Um, I know when I've started in places, I just have a, you know, a little running list of acronyms. We have so many acronyms. We have acronyms <laughs> that mean two different things, three different things. Um, but just a curiosity, you know, you've got to understand how it all fits together because you can't go and 
and come up with something new and, uh, and, and really significantly different if you don't know how things are working, if you're in a, a large corporation. You've got to understand what they have and then where are those opportunities. And you've got to build your network too, because if you're in a large oh, yeah. company, oh, yeah. like the people network is really important, because you might start in one spot and you see this other area where they're really working on some groundbreaking ideas. Um, you've got to do your, your networking to see if you can get over there. Inside and across companies. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So can you describe the workplace of tomorrow and the workforce of tomorrow? And what kinds of employees and companies are going to fix that and they're going to make the most difference? Um, we always see it's fun to be old enough to see those new innovative companies that came out of nowhere starting to decline and deteriorate and follow <laughs> Sears down the toilet. So it's, it's just really interesting. What is the workplace going to need? What do our students need to be like? And what can we do to help them? I think the, the good news is, is if you look at generation, I think they're Z, is that what we're on right now? Which is the folks right now who are in college at university. Uh, one of the hallmarks of that generation is their entre entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, so I think already they're digital natives, um, so they already have a lot of what they need to be fluent in this. I would argue that's at the surface. I don't it's, argue that that's at the depth. They can yeah, most it's, certainly it's, it's, it's test like it's, faster it's, than it's, I. It's your, it's your starting point. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's not this fear factor as much of what is, this com what is a computer, what is it going to do. When I started, no one had a home computer. We had game consoles, and you could do a little coding on them, but we didn't have, it wasn't prevalent to have that. So I think at least you've, you've got that start. Mine were steam powered. What are you talking about? <laughs> you had punch cards. I did not, <laughs> I did, I did not have ICS2, punch cards. Last ICS2 class on punch cards No here. punch cards. I did okay, have the terminal, sucked. though, where you had to type in, and it had the paper. So I'm always reluctant to draw. I, there's almost nothing I hate more than stupid labels of Gen X and Z as if all 23-year-olds are the same at any given time. <laughs> what I experience in San Francisco these days is that there is so many people have a friend who's already made a ton of money that everyone is extremely impatient. Sorry, yeah, I just said everyone. There is a propensity <laughs> to be extremely <laughs> impatient and believe that if you're not a principal engineer or a director by the time you're 24, that something is wrong with your career and you get unhappy. And I keep counseling people that you've got a 40-year career, most likely, and to uh, be patient. focus on learning and focusing on, I don't remember which was Sandy or Owen said, just focusing on as many different things, and learning as many different things as possible, and not just trying, I mean, I, I've literally had situations lately where you know, someone wants to leave the company they're at for another company because they're going to make like $5,000 more per year. And it's just like, you're 23, like you shouldn't be thinking this way. You should be thinking about your long career arc. And I think that's just getting more difficult because everything is so superheated in the current marketplace. I'm going to turn this a tiny bit. Okay. I was fortunate, incredibly fortunate, to work with a man named Jim Gray. I worked as a close friend of his and, a men and he was my mentor for 25 years. And I actually targeted a company change so I could work with him. I, just, I, I don't have to work here. I can work there. I've got a tandem and work with Jim. And that's a great reason to move switch companies. Yeah. And, yeah, that, and I ended up working with him, and he was a friend for 25 years until he went missing at sea and won the Turing Award. And amazing. And he taught me more life lessons and more computer science lessons than you can imagine. How can we create an environment in the workplace that makes that far more normal? and far more natural for Makes people to be a mentor to the folks around them. And that at, at human, right? I'm gonna give you one human anecdote from Jim. I was so furious at this colleague, and I went to his office and closed the door and talked about how I didn't like her and how, what these horrible things she was doing. He looks at me calmly and he said, I know, it could be worse, you could be married to her. <laughs> <laughs> and roughly once a week, I thank goodness that I'm not married to this person I'm interacting with. And I get calm and happy. And so that Zen comes from guidance. How are we doing? I see that's what a PhD advisor does. I know that. And I think that's awesome. 
I don't see that enough in industry. And how are we working to make that better in industry so we can be there for the folks that we can help cook? So that, that's actually something you don't have to target with the 23-year-olds. That's, that's really targeting those who are managing them. And mm -hmm. I think this is yeah. Some, yeah. something you see, I, at least I've seen across a wide range of companies I work for, is that um, a lot of companies on the engineering side like to promote from the engineering task force. Mm -hmm. And uh, you basically like your manager like quit and congratulations, full promotion, you're a manager now and here's your 12 people and good luck. And, at least for me, in my entire academic career, I never learned a single thing about how to manage humans. And that's completely different from how to talk to computers. And uh, that's a skill that I picked up over time to a degree. Uh, but I, I wish I, I had taken a class on like, just the, the basics of like, managing humans and like, dealing always with little flaws and problems. Uh, we, we don't really educate people to interact with other humans in our education. We really like, focus them on academic topics and academic achievements. And that, I think, creates the managers that, that all of us have probably met along their careers who are genius, technically speaking, but just like really terrible in inspiring you and like mentoring you and helping you in your career. So, or even listening to your problem and how things, you've had a bad day. Just being there as a human being. And that, that's like, that's a lot of your reports need, like the feeding and caring and like, hey, how are you doing? I mean, and like, how's the kids? And like, I mean, and the, guy, the person in the next office. Right? Nobody tells you this thing. Like, if I, I managed groups of 50 or 1,500 people before like, I got the first, like, piece of advice how to manage people. Yeah. Uh, and that, that was very strong. Right. <laughs> Amongst others, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, but it, it feels to me like we don't even tell the students coming out that, I think it was mentioned earlier, 90% of your happiness at work is whether you like those people, right? If you don't like them, you don't want to be there. Right? And you can, you can pick them too. So the most important piece of career advice I give, give people is that pick the person you want to work for. Everything else doesn't matter. Like company success goes up and down, and like your role in the company next year might be something very different. What specific you're working on doesn't matter. It's totally going to change. As long as you like the person you work for, um, good. It will, it will, that person will pick something you will like. And then if you need to find a new spot in a company, that person is going to find you someone else that you're going to like working for. And so that's, I think, the biggest career happiness is like picking the person that you work for. And uh, if you give people that advice, very rarely do they walk out of a company unhappy, no matter what they worked on, no matter how the company evolved. So I think we have time for questions from the audience. I mean, anybody want to ask something? I'm going to give my answer, and some of my colleagues will probably not like it, but uh, my personal advice to everyone in a big company, if once, a, once this is like, let's do a disrupt, disruption and like, be like a startup, is like, put up your resume, get a new job, and run. Don't walk, run. <laughs> <laughs> That's maybe just based on my personal experience, as I said in the beginning. Like, there is something very special about like not having any money and like being like wily coyote running off the cliff, and like you, you need to like find wings or you will fall down. That I think creates a certain forcing function to keep a team on track, and uh, the scarcity of resources makes it scrappy in a way that, in, in a cushy corporate environment, I think is very hard. There is exceptions. There is successful spinouts, and there's companies that reinvent themselves and, and whatnot, but. In general, you're more likely to like, end up in a company that's going to go in circles and bring in like, uh, management consultant people and just, just run, <laughs> just go away. So one of the, I think it, it's really, really hard for big companies to allow innovations, especially innovations that disrupt their main business, right? The, the inventor's dilemma is absolutely real, sure. right? I mean, you, it's really hard to convince management to support anything that disrupts their current business line. Um, and so, yeah, you almost always end up spinning out or something. But I find it fascinating that when Facebook took over Sun's old headquarters, they made a lot of changes. They basically remodeled the entire inside of the, the set of buildings. But they left the backs of some of the signs saying Sun precisely so that they remind their employees that if you stop innovating as a tech company, you're dead. Maybe not the building, but the company. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna, the other advice I give people all the time is never work for a flat or shrinking company. It's a heck of a lot of fun to work for a growing company. It's like, oh, we got a new team member, great, that's awesome. Versus, oh no, who are, who's gonna get laid off next week? Right, yeah. And so <laughs> that's another relevant piece of it. Also, never do something you don't like. I think that's one of the benefits of having such a heated market is that oh, yeah, we're anyone lucky. can go out and find a new job. So it, it, 
you do not like what you're doing or you're not learning something new, or just like if you come to, to work and it's just comfortable, you know exactly how to solve the problems every day. Do something else, do something uncomfortable that you're like terrified because you don't know that it works and you have to learn and, and stretch yourself. That's one of the benefits I, th I think right now of the, the field that we are in, that it's constantly expanding and growing and doing new things. So I'm gonna wrap it up with the following. When I started at ICS, it was not obvious there was any career opportunities working in computer science. And nobody really wanted to work in it unless they were quirky and crazy. And I just stumbled into it because I had a passion and it was fun and it was so cool. And now we're in this world where we are just like the 19th century railroaders. We are like it. We're the robber barons. It's kind of fun. Everything's exploding. And we're bringing value to society, <laughs> arguably, um, much like the railroads did, arguably. And so we're just, I'm blessed for what I was given here. I'm blessed for this opportunity in this career. I'm blessed for the mentors I had and the friends that I had. And I just hope that the kids cannot be equally lucky. So I'm going to wrap it on that. Is that good?